Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation number 336, recorded Friday, March 2nd, 2018. David Hewlett. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by LegalZoom. It's National Small Business Month. Go to LegalZoom.com slash startup to download your free business startup kit today. And for special savings, enter Triangulation at checkout. And by FreshBooks, the easy-to-use cloud accounting software for small business owners. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash triangulation. Hello and welcome to Triangulation. It's the show where we bring the luminaries, the fascinating people from our community of tech. We bring them here into the Twitch studio so that you can pick their brain here about their efforts to make the world a better place. I'm Father Robert Ballester, the digital Jesuit, and I have the distinct honor of welcoming a true geek, someone who you've probably seen if you've run in the sci-fi and fantasy circles. He's an actor, a director, a producer, a voice actor, and a maker, a true honest-to-goodness maker. You've seen him on TV in everything from ER to Dark Matter to Stargate, and he's brought his talents to the recently Oscar-nominated The Shape of Water. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Mr. David Hewlett. Thank you very much, David, for joining us on Triangulation. Oh, such a pleasure. Like, absolutely. I'm, I've been so excited about this for weeks now, weeks, months maybe even. Oh, we've seen you a few times here on the Twit TV network. You recently did an episode of uh, Tech News Weekly talking about Hulagram, which <laughs> for for us children of the 80s and before, we will remember Auto Man. You were basically doing an homage to Auto Man as, as a proof of concept that today's technology could make things look like the 80s. It was it was actually amazing. Uh, let's let's just start with that because that was kind of fun. What got you into <laughs> Hulagram? Uh, it was Aaron, really. It was it was um, uh, the director who uh, works for Red Giant, and I was looking for visual effects because I had this. I, I was I was finding this very frustrating position of being apparently in the industry, talking to industry professionals, but seeing better stuff online, like seeing stuff in people's basements that looked better than than the than the effects that I was seeing by you know so called professionals, and I was like. Uh, I was sort of tearing my hair out and saying, like, guys, guys, I just I wanted to look like this. And, and they're like, oh, well, that's just a tutorial from the web. I was like, yes, but it looks amazing. And one of the people who I kept coming back to, one of the companies I kept coming back to was Red Giant because they they had this. I didn't even know they were ads at first, but they were literally to do an ad for their technologies, their software plug in technology. They do these fantastic short films. They did one in particular called uh, Old is New, which to me is one of the most brilliant short films ever made. And it has visual effects, but more importantly, these films have a heart to them. And I, as sort of as a joke in my conniving, weaselly, geeky way, I said, you know, I tweeted, uh, we'll act for software. And Aaron took me up on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and out, and he came up with this, with this, um, this hologram thing. It was, uh, it, it was like a return to my youth. I started making these films with, friends when I was like 13 or 14 years old, um, who have now gone on, Vincenzo Natale has gone on to make Cube and these right. other fantastic films um, and uh, and television series as well. He's working on everything now. But And it was like a return to that, but with people, you know, who were sort of some people who were my age. And it was sort of an introduction to this wonderful sort of independent world in, in New York City. And it was just, oh, it was fa like this scene, like the scene you're looking at right now where I, we're in the car, a, a cop came up to move us along and then went, <laughs> hey, you that guy from, you know, Stargate. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, it's fine. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, so it was like, it just, it was just, it was a really, like just a magical experience. Amazing bunch of people. Aaron, I was sort of joking. We went to this building in, in New York and uh, we're in this like rickety elevator going up to these studios and with my kid and my wife beside me. And I suddenly turned to my wife. I said, you know, I've never met this guy. He could be like we he could the doors could open. He could be standing there with like a bloody axe. And uh, so my son immediately blanches. And um, uh, and then Aaron and I literally didn't even say hi. We just finished a conversation. We'd started online 
you know, a couple of days ago. And uh, yeah, he's just, he's fantastic. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's just a, he's just a really, he's a good, he's a good soul. And, and he's got a love for film that is just so, just comes through in this, in, in, in his work, in all aspects of his work, you know? So yeah, it was, it was a, it was an amazing experience. I, um, I like that moment of you approaching the door thinking, well, we think we're doing something like a Star Trek, but it could end up being Game of Thrones. So I'm not really sure where we're, <laughs> who we're knows? Ending. Yeah. I mean, I, and you, you sort of take for granted, you know, I know so many people now. I mean, you, for example, I mean, uh, you know, I don't expect to see you with an ax, but w w I feel like I know you really well because we talk, a fair amount. Um, and and yet we've never actually met. And that's such an amazing thing that we take for granted now in a way that that it just it this did not exist when we when we started playing with computers. I mean, you know? It didn't really exist more than 15 years ago. Actually, even it really 10 years ago. So this this is a new thing. Uh, uh, it's interesting to me that you said you had this sort of hunger to do things better because you saw these productions on YouTube that had better production values than some of the things that we were doing for TV for huge budgets. And I, I find that hilarious because some of the people I've spoken to who are doing this, people like the Corridor Digital guys or mm. Freddie Wong, they yeah, started doing what they're doing because they saw people like you on their favorite sci-fi shows. And they said, mm. I wonder if I could do that. I, I, I bet I could do that. And that's how they developed their following. So it's sort of like the, the snake eating its own tail. It just feeds well, back into itself. And we're seeing, I mean, it's funny. There was a, I think it was Coppola who said, uh, the director said, not to me, just as a, as, a, as a quote, that he was less scared of other film directors than he was of like a kid in the basement, that that's where the next big hit is gonna come from. And it was, you know, it, it's, it's happening in the film world, but it's not just the film world, it's happening in a, on a much larger scale. It's happening in the makerspace with technology, it's happening um, with education, it's happening, it, it, it's just the revolution is no longer um, uh, you know the, the the realm of the of the big companies and the big money. These that the, there's there's so much stuff out there for people to be doing um, in all aspects of both filmmaking and the technologies around it. Um, another great example was we, you know we were supposed to shoot a it was a dark matter episode and they couldn't get the techno crane, which is this that wasn't a techno crane. It was a, a computer controlled crane. Right. Right. Um, and they're like, oh, I really wanted to get it. We couldn't get it. It was too expensive. I was like, what? What? It's a it's a robot controlled camera. Like what? Like, give me, you know, give, give me like a, give me like a few days and a few nerds and we'll, <laughs> we'll just, we'll have one rigged up for you. But again, there's this, this, I think there's a real disconnect. It happens with the medical community as well. There's a real disconnect between what's available to people and the technologies that are available. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just more and more seeing this chasm between, between the, the sort of as the world of the establishment and these bright minds coming up right now, you know? So I just basically want to befriend them because they're going to run things, so. It's, again, it's it's very wise for you to, to see that across sectors. Not, it's not just a movie thing. It's not just a medical thing. It's it's basically in all sectors. You've you've got a generation that has so many tools available for them, uh, mm -hmm. to them from, from software that can do editing effects that used to cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars just a couple of decades ago to people who are playing with 3D printers and CNC machines who they don't think about whether or not something exists that they can buy. They're wondering, well, how am I going to make it? I'll, yeah. I've got the parts. I'll, I'll put it together. I, well, it's, and it's, yeah, it's a very different it, mindset. It really is. And it's something I'm trying to get my head around still. I mean, I'm still struggling to figure out how, what the best way of approaching, you know, all of these different sort of interests that I have. And it, it's, it's, um, uh, it, it's something I see with the, um, with the medical professions, particularly, where there's been this kind of, obviously, there's been this, you know, there are the doctors and they know they have the lingo, they have the, there's almost like a, uh, um, you know, almost a, almost a theater to, to the, right. to the whole sort of medical profession. And it's a, it's hallowed halls and people shouldn't be messing around with that stuff because it's a human body. And now all of a sudden, like one of the things I came up with for the kids, this, uh, with my, with my, my class was uh, class, my lunch club, um, was that you can actually get these kit these CRISPR kits to do like, genetic modifications on yeast. And uh, I, I was a little nervous to bring it to the class because I thought, oh my goodness, some people are going to really be freaked out by this. So we actually didn't end up doing that this year, but I will, I'm getting them in there at some point. 
<laughs> it's uh, when I was doing genetic experiments in high school, it was basically worksheets saying, OK, well, this is recessive and this is dominant and I'll draw lines from this to this. Now, you're right. I, I actually watched a science fair where someone was working on a new type of yeast that would work under certain conditions. And I was thinking, yeah. uh, wait, you're a high school student? Yeah. You, you, you can do this? That, that's amazing to me. That That is science fiction. That's more science fiction than most of the science fiction that I grew up with. And I think there's no limits. I mean, the, you know, imagine going into this stuff with no idea that there are rules and that there's sort of an established way of doing this stuff. And that's what I'm seeing and I just am that I guess I get so excited about it because that's that's how we got into film back in the day when we back in the day when I was making films as a kid, people didn't do that because you had to have film and you had to process film and there was sync sound. Everything was so complicated. You know, the fact that Vincenzo and Andre were making these films at age 13 and 14 was a complete anomaly. And and, you know, when I got into film as a quote unquote profession after that, I came in with this whole skill set that people just didn't have because they weren't doing this. Like, it's not like now with there's video cameras. Like now people ask me like, how do you become an actor? I'm like, dude, just grab a camera, make something. You gotta do everything now. You know, look at look at YouTube. Those those guys don't just don't just write or direct or star. They have to do everything. And that's, you know, that's the way it is now. We've almost returned back to the day of Charlie Chaplin with that stuff. And the same thing applies, crazily enough, with the with, you know, with medicine, with 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 um, electronics, computers, programming, video games. I mean, look at that industry. That's another one that's just that's just booming out of people's basement. You know, I'm glad that you brought up the good old days, and we're make, we're doing this comparison because I actually do want to bring us back. This whole segment has been sort of a teaser for what they're going to hear as we get closer to the end. But we do have to bring you back to the start because you I'm do... terrible, terrible at staying on topic. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I love it. I love it because people can see a little bit. I mean, there's, there's an, obviously a lot of passion here, but I, I do want them to know about your history because it is, Absolutely, yeah. it's pretty phenomenal. It's, it's pretty interesting how a person like you ended up where you are today. Uh, can we get to that in just a bit? Because we got to pay a couple of bills here with, uh, of course, with the supporter. do it. All right. Well, folks, we have been talking about this new generation of discovery, about this new way of doing things in the medical engineering fields, even in the movies. New technologies, new processes always allow us to push the boundaries of what we think is possible. But no matter how hard you push and how far you go, you're always going to need to make sure that you have legal representation. It's just one of the things about life today, which is why we're so happy to have LegalZoom as a sponsor of this episode of Triangulation. Now, National Small Business Month it, LegalZoom is here. Now, whether you're just starting out now or you already have a business, there's a lot that you can take advantage of. Now, just go to LegalZoom.com slash startup. That's LegalZoom.com slash startup during March to download your free business startup kit. You'll get tons of information. For example, you can find out how to maximize your business deductibles under the new tax laws. Plus, you'll also get great discounts. Your kit includes special deals from LegalZoom along with other offers from their service partners so that you can save a bunch of money financing, marketing, and operating your business. A LegalZoom isn't a law firm, but they know what you need to tap into the right resources to run a successful business. They're not just providing legal services, they're providing life services. That's what their business startup kit is all about. So here's what we want you to do. If you are pushing the boundaries, if you are looking at a new way of doing things, if you think you've got a business model that might change the world, then go to LegalZoom.com slash startup to download your free business startup kit today. That's LegalZoom.com slash startup. There's no obligations, just free business resources. This offer is only available in March. So if you're listening after that, you can still enjoy special savings by using the code triangulation when you check out at LegalZoom.com. Again, that's LegalZoom.com slash startup. And if you're listening to this in a month other than March, use the code triangulation. Legal Zoom, where life meets legal. And we thank Legal Zoom for their support of this episode of Triangulation. We are speaking with Hewlett. He is the man about town. Again, uh, I first saw you in Stargate, um, and I loved it. I love the fact that your character was goofy, was brilliant. Uh, and then it got me to think well, 
well, who is this guy who plays this character? Who is this guy who plays the equal of, of a Samantha Carter? Which, by the way, if you don't know who that is, then it just means you need to watch more Stargate. Let's, yeah. let's bring it back because we know you as the Canadian actor, but you weren't born in Canada. You were born in Surrey. How? Wait, what? Yeah, it's we. we I, I joke that we've got three passports. I'm like the born identity with absolutely none of his skills. And only one language. It's shameful, really. Yeah, well, I was born in England. Born, um, uh, born watching Doctor Who from behind the couch, and uh, you know, really raised. I mean, for the first those first those formative years were all uh, were all British television. I think it's given me a certain a certain type of a certain sense of humor and a uh, um, sort of British outlook on 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 things. There are a lot of Brits in Canada, to be fair. So you know. Yeah, but how did you find yourself in Canada? I mean, going from from Surrey across the the pond, that that's not a normal thing, is it? Well, my I, I, it's, I would have to ask my dad that. I mean, we came across on a Russian uh, a Russian ship because it was a cheap way of doing it. My father had <laughs> very little money. He would just uh, become a doctor in England and basically became disillusioned with with the the system there. There were people. You know, he says he would he would go into the into the hospital. There'd be people, you know, dying in the hallways because there just weren't beds and things. And he wanted to um, sort of start again in a new country, basically. And so he packed us all up on this. The Alexander Pushkin, it was called uh, (laughs) this Russian ship. And I still remember I remember watching these crazy Russian uh, uh, cartoons in a little dark room in this terrible storm and you know, ship walking down hallways that were like this as we, it was just I, like, I, it was it, like in this indelible uh, mark on my, on my, on my memory. And um, yeah, dad came to Canada because I think he was very, uh, yeah, he was very disillusioned. I think with the, with the, with socialized medicine in England and then came to Canada in time to become a doctor when then, then they had socialized, socialized medicine, medicine here as well. So he was, he was, <laughs> he was he's uh, basically a two for two on that. So <laughs> Oh, how how old were you when you made the move? Uh, I was four. Yeah, wow. I was I was four. But we used to go. My my father was really really big on uh, on, on on spending what money we had and sometimes borrowing it so that we could go back in the summers. Every summer we'd go back to England. So I had the best of both worlds. Not in that I had I had uh, winters in Canada and summers, uh, if that's what you can call them, in uh, in England. So. Um, I was. I never saw the sun. Basically, yeah, it sounds a little backwards. Uh, but okay, <laughs> it was. It was amazing, though. Like it was just. It was. I really. You know, we were there for so long. We'd come back with British accents. I mean, we were. You know, and we were. And my my grandparents had this amazing place that was. They used to like rescue horses. Like if a if a horse breaks its leg, they would generally put it down. Not not my then my grandparents would take it and they would raise it like as a pet. So there were just hundreds of animals wandering around this. It was like Dr. Doolittle. Like literally you'd be sitting there talking with grandma and this horse would sort of nose nose open a window and stick its head through the window. She'd give it sugar and then it would leave again. And then you would see and it would – and I'm like this. Everyone thinks I'm kidding when I say this. There are literally dogs riding horses with the reins in their, in their teeth. Like it was – they would just train these dogs to do all these crazy things. Um <laughs> And they just and as so as a kid, it was just magical. Like it was just you know my my uncle was building uh, steam trains uh, across the property using old mining uh, old uh, old Welsh mining uh, uh, steam trains and things. So it, yeah, it was just it was a truly wonderfully eccentric British upbringing every summer. You know, and then we came back to Canada where we were you know back to the sort of the normal sort of the normal side of stuff. You know, not too long ago, the internet broke because a uh, corgi was riding on a horse and that video just went absolutely everywhere. The fact that you got to see that basically every summer, uh, yeah, I guess that was a magical experience. It was, yeah, we had, it was a golden retriever. They used to have the, they always had golden retrievers and uh, they would, uh, and uh, and collies were the other ones as well. And they were just these, I don't know how they, they just trained them within an inch of their lives. Like it was all very loving, but the, the animals would just, you know, no, like, Nobody can obsessively take on, uh, you know, a pet and make it such a hobby like the British. Like the British get into their hobbies in a way that, that nobody else can, you know? All right. So you have, at the tender age of four, transported yourself from the UK to Canada aboard the Russian battleship Potemkin. Uh, I know it's a Pushkin, but Potemkin <laughs> sounds so much better. That's enough. <laughs> but where do you, how do you go from that 
from that four-year-old in a new country going back and forth in summers uh, between his new land and his old land to developing a passion for creating content? Hmm. It's, I mean, I, I was really bad at everything else that helped. Um, you know, I was, I was a huge tinkerer as a kid. Like I used to, I used to raid the, every garbage I could find and, and any old guy, if we found a television set, that was, that was like gold. I would bring those things home and pull them apart. And eventually I got one working and it was, but I, I, was very good at failing to put things back together again. And for, for years, I, I, you know, I, I sort of saw that as a, as a failure. And the, the reality is you learned so much about this stuff. And in doing so, I, I found this sort of theatricality to, to electronics. I found this desire to build things the way Doctor Who would build things. And I think before I actually realized you could be an actor, I wanted to be a time lord. That was my <laughs> that was my thing. I was I spent the, the amount of time I spent trying to build a sonic screwdriver is embarrassing, you know? Because it just seems so logical to me. Like of course you make the right sound, it vibrates. Of course it's going to vibrate things out of there out of place and unlock things and and you know and and take out baddies and things. So I was so my in my in to acting was was through science fiction, specifically, you know, Doctor Who and my my mom would my mom was my mom was pretty good at this stuff. So there's like Quater Mass was in there as well. And the Tomorrow People, you know, they were quite the thing about the the thing about about the UK is that uh, sci fi isn't marginalized in any way with England right, and right. and Europe. It's seen as just as legitimate a genre as, you know, drama or comedy or, or you know, or any of the other ones. Um, so it was never any it, it was never seen as a as a, a you know, as the as the, the, the you know, was it the redheaded stepchild of, 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 of the rest of film and television, which, again, it's, it's coming back into its own now. The, the A movies are now B movie are now basically B movie science fiction. Um but that was so I was growing up with a with a healthy respect for for science fiction. My my mom basically forced my mom and my dad basically forced me to watch Doctor Who, whether I was, you know, screaming and crying. But, you know, I, I loved it. I loved how terrifying that stuff was. And look at it now. I just I wonder why. But, you know, it was it's characters. You get you get caught up in those characters. And I I was sucked in by this fantastic Doctor Who character who seemed to always have an answer but was still somehow at risk and um, was always, always had a good comeback, always had some technical explanation. And the other thing that was very smart was TVO that showed it here had, they sort of, because the British shows were either too long or too short for the, the American uh, schedule, they didn't always sort of end on the hours that as, as all the American stuff did. Uh, there was a chunk of time that they had to make up and they made up for it by having this fantastic uh, wild haired scientist explaining some of the technologies and how they could be real or, or, or talking about technologies that related to this, to Dr. Who. So for me, there was almost no, there was no, dis, there was, there was no way of distinguishing to me between science fiction and reality. They were all part of the same thing. So I think that really got my imagination going and, and I think has really helped to, sort of craft me as a as a nerd and as a as a as an actor right you know there there is an interesting distinction that we can make here because especially in the united states there's a lot of stuff that gets grouped into sci-fi which really doesn't it's not really sci-fi it's sci-fi ish yeah. they might set it in the future they might set it in space but a real sci-fi work be it a book a movie tv show whatever it might be it appeals to, I think you alluded to this, with, with you trying to make that sonic screwdriver, it, it appeals to people who try to figure things out. It, mm. it, it makes us feel better when we think, okay, no, there's, there's actual physics behind that. That's, that's why there's a Star Trek The Next Generation technical manual. Uh, that's yeah. why people are explaining things like the Epstein Drive on The Expanse. That's why people are actually coming up with ideas. Oh, no, a ZPM from, from the Stargate universe. Zero point, of course. If you can extract energy down to the zero point, you can, you can basically go down to the very lowest energy state, and that's an infinite amount of energy. It, it's, it's amazing to hear people talk about these things in terms that are not sci-fi. They actually try to explain what they see. And I think that's yeah. that's one of those things that, that it, it marks true sci-fi. When it gets us excited on that level, you know you've hit the the right note. Yeah, I think it's twofold. I think there's there's a wonderful escapism to science fiction. 
there's this it's it's a it's a it's a plausible especially when there's sort of plausible futures for me that always it really excites me so there's that aspect and then as you say i think there was a great quote i was talking to these guys at um open bci these brain computer interface guys brilliant bunch of guys um and connor is one of the guys who 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 uh, created and ran that company who runs that company and he said um uh, that he felt that science fiction was really the first uh, the first stage of engineering, and that's the dreaming phase. And you can see that. I mean, all of the technology that we use today, you know, it's been influenced by, I mean, mainly by Star Trek. I mean, right. that's like a lot of that stuff comes comes from that. But but you know, the people, the people who whose interests were piqued by the science fiction will go on to invent that stuff or to, you know, or to create their own versions of it, really, as you say. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's almost a game. It's a game for us to see if we could create something that we saw in a sci-fi program, which mm -hmm. then reinforces that sci-fi program. It, we form emotional bonds to the sci-fi that we love. We really Absolutely. do. I mean, it's, it's stronger than any attachment to any show I've ever seen. When you find characters that you love, when you find a storyline that you can sympathize with, you're in and, and you're in all the way. Uh, even if it becomes a show that you hate, you're still in, which is amazing to me because you don't normally find that in uh, in the industry of entertainment. It's true, you know. I take a huge, I, I take great glee in hating movies. Like I will watch movies, I'll watch them twice because they're so bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's and it's true. I think you there's a I don't know what it is. It's it's you know besides you know it's, it's like some self torture of some sort, but. I, you know, I there's something to be said for. I think again because I don't think it was always taken very seriously. There's a lot of terrible science fiction out there, and also science fiction tends to get blurred into horror, which is uh, which is a shame, and which is a, a, a you know a pit that I fell into as well. Where you know people don't want just science fiction because that's just going to be nerds, and we want to open it up to more people. So it's got to have romance, it's got to have comedy, it's got to have you know what I mean. Like they're scared of just science fiction. And pure science fiction, when it's done right, is just, as you say, you just, you just lose yourself in it. There was a, there was a scene in Stargate. I remember where we were introducing my sister to uh, the yes. whole concept of Star Trek, of, of Star Trek. Now, now I'm doing. I'm past my dad. Well, which, by the um, way, uh, editor's note here: um, the actress who played his sister in Stargate was actually Hewlett's sister. Is actually yeah, Kate. Yeah, I some, I've now I have to admit it now. I never used to, but now she's on TV. I have to sort of, yeah. She was and she was fantastic. But she had I was so sort of, uh, to me there was this sort of weird moment where I saw her. I mean, poor poor Kate was sort of pulled off a plane and <laughs> thrown into this onto the set and told to look at a dot on a green screen and go like wow. But I knew obviously what they were going to put in there, and I just kept thinking like this is this is what people love about Stargate. You've got these fun characters who get to constantly remind the audience that this could be real. There may be stuff out there, you know. Um, and if it's not Stargate, it's you know there's something like it. There's you know the military's up to something. Um, and it's just you get those shivers, those moments where you get those little shivers, and you're like, oh, that's a that's a world. Even if I even if it doesn't exist, I am willing to will it into existence. You know. Oops. You're Someone's man. at my front door. That's my ring. That's your ring video doorbell, which, by the way, is That's a sponsor it. of yeah, the yeah, Trick yeah. TV network. Uh, actually, uh, I, I want to use that. Can we step behind the camera just a bit? Because I always I get a chuckle every time I watch that episode, which, by the way, I have all the DVDs, and they basically just play on loop when, at my workstation because <laughs> I, I always like having something running whenever I'm editing. It, it makes me giggle thinking you pulled your real sister into your universe. This was a universe that you were crafting. You were, you're hmm. one of the stars. You're one of the, the main actors. You bring her in to do, it's a large role and it actually becomes a recurring role. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't have if she hadn't done a good job. That's right, <laughs> exactly. Be, she'd but, have died pretty quick if she hadn't done a good job. But there had to be a little bit of that brotherly, yeah, you're coming into my world now. You have to take your cues from me, right? I mean- Oh, I lot it over all the time. Yeah, I still do that. I I'm, I consider her, I, I welcomed her into this world too, as far as I'm concerned. So I, she owes me all the time. No, I. It, what's funny about that was, it was a, there was a, a scene far earlier on where 
I mentioned having a, a you know a distant relationship with a brother. And right. while we were shooting, and I said, look, I'm not asking you to cast a sister or anything, but I just I have I have five younger sisters. I just think it'd be much funnier for me and possibly for other people if if it was a sister that I had you know this issue with. Um, and they're like, yeah, whatever, fine. Stupid actors have to change every line. And but they went with it. And then um, I made Dog's Breakfast because I wanted to play with directing, but also because I wanted to show off uh, Kate because I just thought like Kate is like the funniest woman I've ever met. Like she's just she just for some reason, she's just got this really fun, warped, twisted sense of humor. And we are just merciless to each other. Like we just, we just, you know, it, we shouldn't like each other, but for some reason we do. Um, and people are always shocked to some, people who don't have siblings are, are shocked by the way we treat each other. The reality is that's what it's like having, having sisters, you know, or brothers or whatever. Uh, you are one of the few cast members of the Stargate universe that has actually been in all three TV shows. You've been in Stargate <laughs> SG-1, you were a star, you were one of the main roles in uh, Stargate Atlantis, and then you also had a role in Stargate Universe. Uh, Which was terrifying. <laughs> it's kind of, but there was such a shift between Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe, and I know that was intentional, and honestly, I actually, I miss Stargate Universe. I wish they had a chance to wrap up that story. Uh, the hardest yeah. thing that they had going for them was that they had Stargate in front of their name. Exactly. So I think if you had just been called Universe and people could discover it on its own, uh, you know, it would have been, I, 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 I think it would have run for, it would have run for ages. I mean, the problem was, I think, that because it was Stargate, and it was coming out of Atlantis, which is very much a very different show. I mean, I used to joke, they didn't like it, but I used to joke that we were the Disney of of science fiction. Of course, now that's Star Wars. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the idea that it was like, you know, we were like the family getting together to sit down and watch science fiction, like I did Doctor Who. Um, and at the time, everyone wanted to be Battlestar, you know, and Battlestar, my God, I, like, I love right, Battlestar. Right. But the, you're not as a family sitting down with the kids to watch Battlestar. That's a lot to explain. That would be a weird uh, family. If <laughs> That would be really weird. I'm sure we're basically there. Like, we watch Stranger <laughs> Things. So, you know, uh, but, you know, so to for anyone coming out of out of Atlantis and then diving into SGU, it would have been a shock because it's just not they're just not the same shows. Um, you know, it's a beautiful, I start universe is, is beautiful and the acting's fantastic. The writing's gorgeous. I, it's just, it just, it's just a very different show than, than Atlantis. And I was very worried when, when they mentioned me coming in, cause I was like, well, well what is this? Like, what are we, are we, are we going to mash them all together again now? I mean, how do I fit in this world? Like, I don't, I'd seen universe and I was like, this, this is not a McKay's world. Like right. it, and, and Brad was just, I mean, Brad is, Brad's a brilliant writer had just did this, I thought, walked this beautiful line of comedy. There's still McKay there, but it, it, it was, he was, he was, he worked in the, in the universe world. And I just thought that was, I thought he did a fantastic job of that. Um, and I wish I'd done more. I mean, they, they were talking about if it had gone again, I, I think they were talking about, about coming back, but, but, um, you know, I loved it. I, I was, you know, but as I said, I was really nervous going into that because that wasn't my show. And, you know, uh, and I didn't know anybody and I felt kind of weird because you're sort of like, I know all the crew and I know like, this is my, my joke was like, you're eating my sandwiches, you know, um, which was taken, which was misconstrued by the way. I actually, you know, um, uh, Lou Diamond Phillips was like, uh, was like, so is it okay that we're eating your sandwiches now? And I was like, and I had, I'd forgotten I'd said that. I was like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, I was like, yeah, have a sandwich. Sure. I don't like, you know, whatever. And he reminded me that I'd said this and I, I, I guess I tweeted or something. And, and I was like, oh, I was like, well, now, you know, me, you must understand. It's only about the food. <laughs> I guess it's nothing personal. It's just that I, I liked having craft service around. Um, but so there was definitely this weird kind of us and them feeling coming in there. And I was definitely on their turf, but they were lovely, you know. And again, the performance is like, God, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Louis fantastic. Like, God, that guy's that guy could turn it on and off like it, it, it's like a like a switch. It's amazing. Um, and and then you know, LDP, uh, they were all just they were. I I yeah, I was I I didn't want to leave once I started, you know. So well, uh, you and Lou Diamond have another uh, honor that both of you. There are very few of you. I think it's you, Lou Diamond Phillips, Amanda, who have played 
two versions of yourself in the same episode. Ha. Uh, which, right. Which is, that's kind of cool. <laughs> it's, they're the worst episodes. <laughs> to to oh, shoot there, on. just, they come are on. hell. <laughs> they are hell to shoot. You know, it's like, I, there was there's something very telling in that, in that I, I couldn't stand my, my double. <laughs> I was, I was so horrible. This poor guy, this guy came in and I was like, and he just, it's impossible that anyone is going to work as hard and be as, you know, attentive to what is McKay than McKay, obviously. And um, I just thought it was so funny that I was I basically started channeling my own McKay towards this this poor guy who was playing me. And I, I wouldn't do it like that. We need to go again. This is why is he doing that? You know, um, and uh, it was uh, oh, God, it's it's. I mean, they're fantastic episodes. They're like actors' dreams. Like, you know, people ask me who my favorite person was to work opposite in Stargate. I, I get to say myself. Um, <laughs> but, but boy, the logistics of shooting that is just, especially back then, too, because, again, motion-controlled cameras. Right. And back then, they were, oh, my God, there was like a, there was like a village showed up of people to control all these things. And I, I just kept thinking, like, Hmm. Are you programming it with punch cards? Like it just had that feeling of those big glass um, air conditioned rooms back in the day of the mainframes, you know? Right. Right. Uh, but I mean, when, so when Lou Diamond Phillips played two versions of, of himself on the same episode, it was, it was a time jump. So I don't mm -hmm. know if he was actually, no, he was never on, on screen twice. He was never with himself. Amanda had to do it when she had a replicator double, and then you, of course, had to do it with the alternate universe, Rodney. Uh, Rod, and, and now yeah. that now that you say that you've got these computer control cameras, how difficult was it to set up those kinds of shots where you actually have to interact with yourself? Well, that's it. You've got the timing. It becomes less about acting and more about the just this technical stuff, which again is I I, I sort of pride myself on that because that's what I grew up doing. Like we. You know, Vincenzo's one of Vincenzo's first films. It was so expensive to do to get a sound camera that we would shoot on these old. He wanted to shoot 16 mil. And we had these old like wind up, basically <laughs> wind up 16 mil cameras that had like a, an electric motor sort of jammed on it. And it sounded like a sewing machine. So we recorded the dialogue first and then I lip synced to the dialogue on camera. Wow. So. It was stuff like that where I just assumed that acting was supposed to be the most awkward, complicated, you know, and disjointed experience. And so when you come into science fiction, I, I, you know, that that to me, that's like, great. What do you got? You know, like there's a tennis ball. Perfect. What is it? Great. Dinosaur. Fine. You know, like that's to me, there's an art to that. And I really pride myself on that. I love I love that. I, I love that challenge to me. The more lines you give me. The harder they are to say, the more critical it is that it all happens in one take. Like, I hate it and will push back and I'll be the grumpiest jerk you can imagine. But boy, I love it when you get it right. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's that feeling. It's the, yeah, swished it. <laughs> I got, yeah, got, it's, that's the take. It, that's the take. It's the, it's the equivalent of like extreme sports only for acting. <laughs> uh, right. Let, let, let's be make it clear that you actually had a career before Stargate. Uh, you you did a couple of TV shows. Uh, you had your first movie as uh, Chucky in The Dark Side. One of my cult favorites is Cube. This is before Hypercube. Yeah. This You were the architect. You were one of the first characters that we see on screen. There uh, is no way out of here. There is no way out of here. And, and But of course, everyone really started to know you as Dr. McKay. On yeah. Stargate SG-1, you were brought in for a two-part episode, uh, and you were re really playing opposite of Amanda. Uh, you were the yeah. two smart people in the room who uh, had an immediate love-hate relationship, which I love. It was one of my favorite episodes of all time. However, mm. we get to see Dr. McKay kind of evolve from that first two-parter to mm. your, your a few more exp uh, um, exposures in SG-1 until you take the lead in Stargate Atlantis. How how did that happen? How much were you able to shape the character as you went on? And you start saying, well, look, I'm, I'm no longer just a one-off. I now have to be part of this universe. This has to be my story. It's interesting. I mean, they the writers handle that stuff. I mean, that's their, you know, the the credit, the true sort of credit for that series has to go to the writers because you you to, when you create these characters and keeping them alive on a weekly basis, I mean, they just did, they did a magnificent job of that. And I think I, I like won on that because... 
I was playing this weird sort of hybrid of a few of the writers, you know, because writers are very, you know, writers are like, they're like, they're like little gods, you know, they've got their worlds and they, they control lives and they, you know, and I, and I, that, so a lot of the McKayisms came out of, I used to joke that I would be, McKay is basically just some kind of a, of a, of a child of, of, um, of, uh, of Cooper and, uh, and, and Brad Wright, because they're both just so smart, so, you know, uh, uh, just sort of, I, I, I can't put a word on it. Like just, just this is their sarcasm. There's, they're snarky. They're, you know, they're just, you know, they're, and they're just wonderfully smart, funny people to be around. And so, uh, you know, they, you know, they were dripping McKay before we, before he was even, before he's even existing. But the real, I mean, real, another, another real sort of genesis for, for, for McKay was working with Amanda because Amanda, I had known of Amanda. I'd sort of run into Amanda, I think, a couple of times when we were both in Toronto. But she'd been, you know, out west for ages on on um, SG One. She was so welcoming, and she is so welcome. It's not just me. I mean, she was with everybody. She was incredibly good at making you feel comfortable. She's also in a position where, you know, if you get if you get a regular actor who doesn't want to play, you're you're dead. I mean, you just you you're you're basically you know, the after a while, the the leads of the show start to run the show because, you know, they know their characters better than anybody. And she was so giving in that she allowed me she allowed me to 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 really push that in a way that I, I think had it been sort of half had it been half assed, it would have not have been it just wouldn't have been the same. Um, so really, I think you, know, you have to have to give credit to her. She is. Uh, she's a she's a she's a you know a uniquely wonderful individual, Amanda. She's you know uh, I mean she's obviously gorgeous, but but I think a lot of that comes from just what a what a just what a wonderful person she is. I mean she's just she just she I, I you know I use this term you know the people light up a room and she she's one of those people who just walks in and it's like you 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 can't take your eyes off her and it's and it's not just looks it's it's there's there's something in there you know what I mean. Well, another thing about Amanda is that she kind of broke down some of the stereotypes and, and the tropes that you got in sci-fi before her because you used to have characters like a Ripley who was badass and that, that was her thing. She was a badass. She was a warrior. And then you would have other characters who were very smart, but that's really all they contributed. She had that interesting character where she was a genius and she would solve things on her own and, and save the team. And she would also be the person in the firefight. Uh, and yeah. That that really made it was like oh yeah yeah that character actually works that makes sense yeah. yeah yeah it's amazing I mean it's 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 funny that that there's that that it's it's funny to see that that sort of shift throughout television and seeing it more and more now yeah. I mean it's it's amazing I do I do get a little frustrated when people talk about like this oh why you know there were no good female leads and I was like well Ripley is a great example of a good female lead I mean right. that's a right. you know. Um, uh, you know, I think science fiction is great at pushing those boundaries or can be great at pushing those boundaries. It can also be terrible um, yeah. because, as I say, there's often the demands of of distribution that they want, you know, half naked women on the on, and, a, and a burning helicopter in the, in the back of a, of a shot, you know, whether that makes sense or not. Um, yeah, on one you know, hand, on one hand, you get uh, the women of the expanse who are all strong, incredible warriors. And the other yeah. hand, you get Cleopatra 25, 25. It's like, okay, exactly. well, exactly. Yeah, here, miss. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. My wife was actually asking about Barbarella the other night, and saying, <laughs> we be, "I just, well, I'm, just, I'm curious to see how that would hold up. Like, wh like I just, I don't know where that sits in. Like, was that progressive or was it yeah. incredibly? You know, I mean, like, I, I'm curious to sort of see it again for that reason. Um, you know, you purely for that reason, of course. Uh, but <laughs> well, so uh, much, so much of that movie is is based on whether or not it's self aware at that particular moment. Uh, because it, yeah. if it's tongue in cheek, it makes sense. If they were directing it straight, you kind of scratch your head and go, I'm not exactly sure what you're going for right now. Yeah. The seventies yeah. or the sixties, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what you talk about the expanse. I, I saw, I know I was gloating about it on, on Twitter the other day. I saw the first episode for season three. <sighs> Jealous. Like, I, oh my God, those effects are so I love gorgeous. that series. It is, it oh. is, I, it, we haven't had a hard sci-fi series like that in a while. That's, yeah. that's just immediately likable. Um, you know, and some, some of my favorite series of Battlestar Galactica, Stargate, of course, Dark oh. Matter. 
and now we've got the expanse and that's that's where i spend my sci-fi money yeah oh it's yes it's it's stunning i i do want to go on a little bit i, I want to go behind the scenes of stargate just a tiny tad before we move sure, on because yeah. you've done a lot since then but uh, can we take just a moment to thank another sponsor Absolutely. fantastic of course you go for it all right well folks you know we here at Twit, we are filled with entrepreneurs. We're filled with people who have done a lot with our careers. We've moved from spot to spot. We've done contracting. We've followed our passions and our dreams, but sometimes those passions and dreams need to get paid, and that's not always fun. I mean, I'm not a money person. I'm not a finance person. I know that uh, people like Leo Laporte, we love making content. We love creating things, but when it's time to get paid, it's best to have someone who actually knows how to do it, which is why we're so happy to have FreshBooks as a sponsor of Triangulation. Now, this episode is brought to you by FreshBooks, and they understand that tax season is a stressful time for freelancers and small business owners, but it doesn't have to be. You can fight your tax fears with FreshBooks, the easy to use cloud accounting software for small business owners. Their intuitive dashboard will give you quick access to your spending, your outstanding balances, your total profit, and other accounting reports so that you'll know how you're doing at any given moment. Now, FreshBooks automatically connects to your bank account and updates expenses daily. And that means that that dashboard will give you a at a glance look of how you're doing. What invoices do you have pending? What money do you have coming in? What money do you have going out? And with FreshBooks, you can send professional-looking invoices in seconds. No more using an old standard generic word template to ask for uh, your money to get paid. You can save time accepting credit cards online and get paid an average of two times faster. It also means no more chasing clients for payments or waiting in line at the bank. You can accept credit cards directly from your invoice. You can see what invoices have been sent viewed and paid, as well as overdue and outstanding. FreshBooks allows you to create proposals with rich text content, images, customizable sections, and more. And FreshBooks makes it easy to bill for time by client and by specific project. Well, FreshBooks recently added Spanish and Dutch languages as options for invoices, estimates, and proposals. The bottom line is that FreshBooks lets you look like a big firm. It lets you look like your accounting department is on it when it's really just you and FreshBooks. And with the FreshBooks app, you can stay connected to your clients and keep tabs on your business no matter where you are. Take a picture of a receipt, upload it, and let FreshBooks do the rest. Our payment schedules can now be set up from the FreshBooks iOS app, and you can now see attachments or existing proposals. The additional push notifications on iOS, you can be notified when a client hasn't viewed an invoice, estimate, or proposal in seven days. That's very important if you're trying to get paid. And when a client comments and when an invoice becomes overdue, you can set yourself up for a stress-free tax season next year with FreshBooks. It all starts now because, remember, you got to start thinking about the next year so that it's not as, ni as much of a nightmare as it is this year. Set yourself up from payment reminders to late fees it allows you to automate as much or as little as you'd like to and get back to what you love doing. And for us, that means making content. Here's what we want you to do. We want you to try FreshBooks free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash triangulation and enter triangulation in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash triangulation, freshbooks.com slash triangulation. And we thank FreshBooks for their support of triangulation. We're back with David Hewlett. Hewlett. What precipitated you being a lead on Stargate Atlantis? Because, I mean, you, you, were, you were a fun character in SG-1, but they could have gone anyway. What made them say, no, McKay is the character we want as the, the main science guy lead? Well, they didn't. I mean, that was the funny thing. Was I, it's, One of the first things I read when I got the, the part and they sort of announced it was, was on chat. And someone said, like, of all the characters they could have picked, why would you pick such a jerk? And I was like, I literally responded, was like, I know, isn't it crazy? Like, you know, it was it was shocking to me. But what was funny was originally the character was an African-American astrophysicist with attitude, basically. <laughs> and um, and I had I'd bothered every member of my of my, you know, agencies and managers and said, like, look, they've got a new series going. Just if could you let them know that I loved working on it? And I and I was literally just just angling to have an episode or two, you know, and, um, and they're like, yeah, yeah, no, of course, we'll get to you. They never happened. No one ever followed up. And then I got um, 
uh, an email from one of the casting agents saying like, oh, you know, by the way, they were talking about how great it would be to have you on the show, you know, if only there was a, you know, a part for you type thing. And um, and then there was a there was a they, there was like a, a casting shift or something. And this is one of the sad, very sad things about the film and television industry is that it's like going to a grocery store and having to pick all of the right, you know, uh, um, you know, we need we need a woman, we need a minority, right. we need, a, and it's and you know, and that's how a lot of these things work, where there's this struggle to to try to you know, uh, maximize eyeballs and all that kind of stuff. Anyways, what had happened was one of the characters had uh, had been cast um, uh, against the original type. And uh, and and so I got this call saying, look, will you come and audition for this for this for this character? And um, I was like, audition, you know, like, like, sure, great. You know, like I'm going in for someone else. Like it just seemed it seemed weird because McKay was such a sort of it was, was a very he was a very recognizable character. So I went in for this audition and the and the cat poor casting agent was like, okay, no, it's they're not looking, they don't want McKay. They want they want this guy. So let's just maybe you could just try to sort of just, you know, and, and I I'd say, yes, yeah, no, to, to, oh yeah, of course, of course. And I do it exactly the same way again. I just went more and more McKay every time. And sort of in frustration, they sort of went, ah, yeah, okay, great, thank you. You know, and off I went. And I thought, oh God, I've either completely screwed this up, or as it Turned out they they were like, yeah, we're um, we're bringing you in. You're not playing Ingram. You're playing it's McKay. And I was like, of course I'm playing McKay. Who else? Are, you couldn't bring me back and not have me play McKay. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, again, I feel like to some extent growing up on science fiction, you know how I I feel like if I wasn't a part of this, I, well, I am anyway. I mean, as a part of it or without a part of it, I, I would be I'd be at these conventions. I would be, you know, I this is what I grew up with. I love this stuff. I feel like I feel like I know how the mind of a fan works because that that's who I first and foremost, that's what I was. So I knew that you're no way they were gonna have McKay show up and not be McKay. There's no it's never gonna happen. So, you know, um yeah, so that that worked out incredibly well. I mean, I it was I literally I had 65 bucks in my bank account. Wow. I I was completely broke. Um, uh, there was a debate on the on the on the contract and I was like, OK, nope, we're not doing it. That's it. I'm playing hardball here. And I sort of walked out of the house and went, oh, my God, I'm completely <laughs> broke. What am I doing? And sure enough, we, they came back and it worked out. And, you know, I, but, you know, and it was. It's what a wonderful way to change your life. I mean, it's just this is the nature of what we do is that just like one phone call, it's like a lottery. You know, I'd love to say it's all talent, but so much of it is just luck and timing. And, you know, I mean, you just got to be ready to go when it when it happens. You know? Well, so. you're being you're being humble. But I mean, if McKay had been played poorly or if Ingram had been played poorly or if the lead science for Atlantis had been a putz. It, mm. it wouldn't have become a, a sci-fi meme, and, and you, McKay is a sci-fi meme. I mean, you you have to you have to admit that people understand what you mean when you're talking about. Oh yeah, the McKay character. It means the yeah. brilliant person who and Patrick Delahanty, who's on staff here at Twit, he says he loves counting up all the episodes in which McKay either was going to cause the destruction of the universe or stop the destruction of the universe. And most of the time right. it, they were in the same episodes. Both. Yeah. Both, yeah, yeah did, did both things yeah. at the same time. Hey, things got to get broke to fix them. <laughs> but I mean, it's a role now. I mean, there's, yeah. there's the McKay role and that means you nailed it. That means you did exactly yeah. what it was supposed to be. And yeah, I like you, I heard the chat rooms light up. In fact, we had uh, a, as Aspire in our chat room saying, I wouldn't have thought McKay for Atlantis because he always seemed no. like a very unlikable character. And that just means you did a fantastic job turning him into a likable character. And that took several seasons because that first season you were still the McKay from SG one. And then you well, became, I, no, you're, this is McKay from Atlantis. Yeah. I always sort of joked about it because it was like everyone else. They were, they were presenting a character. Whereas me was, I was just excusing a character. Like I was just, you <laughs> learned why he was the way he was as opposed to presenting him as a certain way, we were sort of unraveling him, which was always really fun. And again, I thank you. I, I look, it's a dream role. Like it's, it was the, you know, certainly, you know, one of, if not the most, you know, fun uh, character to play. I mean, I, my wife would give me 15 minutes to lose McKay when I got home because I'd come home with still snapping my fingers and stuff. And, um, <laughs> but he was, you know, I, and I think a big part of that is because he, 
he is he's the nerd in all of us. I mean, he's the one he's the guy who wants to be the first person with his hand up and answer the question. He's the guy at the party who says everything you wanted to say, but just wasn't, you know, but you've got the social graces not to. I mean, he's just a fantastic character. Um, and those don't come along a lot. I mean, there's a you know, when I first did that part back in SG one days, I was living in L.A. again, like a like a struggling actor. And I remember going to like this cheap taco place and and this this guy came up and said, you're in that show. And I was like, no, no, I'm not. I'm not in it. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, no, no the, the show with the blonde girl. And shit. and I was like, what? What are you talking about? Because the science fiction and the and I was like, oh, oh, you mean you mean Stargate? He's like, Stargate, you, that. you know, and my first time I was ever recognized, like really, truly recognized from television was SG-1, like one episode of SG-1. Yeah. And I, I was like, it was wow, a great episode. This- it really yeah, was. it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, That's why for me, when because I I didn't hear about any of the the murmurs until after I saw the pilot of Atlantis because I I was really I, I wanted to block myself out. I was excited. There's another series that's spinning off, and when I saw you on screen, I said, "Oh yeah, that makes sense." Yeah, huh. he's he's the only one who's the equal of um, of Carter. So of course you would send him off to another universe. That well, he's the he guy. Could. I'll give you that. <laughs> All right. Well, and what's funny is that first episode, he was Ingram. That's right. That's right. I don't think he even rewrote it. Like, I think it was literally like I was saying Ingram's lines, you know? <laughs> um, so he was a lot more low key. He was, you know, there are little things, but, but you know, for the most part, he was kind of a different character, you right, know? Right. Uh, I, again, let's, let's step back behind the camera. Uh, I, I just wanted to know a little bit about this. You sit down with your cast. And you all get the scripts. Sci-fi uh, and Stargate and uh, Expanse and, and all the other great sci-fis are known for killing off characters. That's if yeah. you know what they do. It's it adds drama and it also adds punch to episodes. What's the first thing that you do when you get the script? Do you do you just go through all your lines? You find out how your character is. I mean, it's not as bad as Game of Thrones, where literally anyone can die in any episode. But what oh, yeah. was that like for you? That's funny. I mean, it was it was. I, I guess I was so you're, I was so involved in it, and I think I was so McKay. I never believed for a second they were ever going to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just I, I felt sort of strangely untouchable because I, I I felt I was a part of that. I was a part of the world of the of our creators, if that makes sense. Um, but it's 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 definitely one of those things where you go, you know, you are so at the mercy of the writers. I mean. You pick up a script and it's like, you know, oh, you're naked on the floor. You're like, what? Oh, God, I've got a, I should have gone to a gym 50 years ago. You know, like you just don't know. There was an, an older actor who sadly just uh, passed away, uh, Bruce Gray. Fantastic guy. He did some Star Trek as well. Um, and uh, he said, you know, because he was a he was he was, he was always bugging me about you got to go to the gym. You got to be fit. You got to be. He said, Cause you just never know when they're going to ask you to take your clothes off, <laughs> you know, Um <laughs> And I was, and I always said, well, there's two types of people in the world: people look good naked, and people look funny naked. I'm a funny naked. So. And if you're going to be funny, you might as well be funny all the way. That's exactly, uh, exactly. Is I, I want to know about that. Is there, um, is there vengeance that writers will take on an actor they don't like? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, wouldn't you? I mean, gosh, I mean, you were. I, I always thought it was one of those. You you walk that line where you're like, you know, like it. It just like why would you? Why would you bite the hand that feeds you? <laughs> you know, I, I and I think that, yeah, definitely. I think there's definitely a sense of that. And, and you know, and there's a there's a weird kind of office politics that sets in when you're on a show for as long as, as everyone is involved in that show. Right. Um, yeah, I think if people got out of line, they, they you know, you'd sometimes get slapped with an episode, you know. So, um, you know, and I, I, you know, I think they took a great, they took great glee in making my life misery um, because, that's I think that's what my character, what I'm good at is, is, you know, is sort of hilariously miserable, <laughs> you know. So I feel like, um, you know, there's definitely there's, uh, yeah, there's definitely a bit of a there's been a bit of an edge to some of the stuff for sure. And, you you know, and writers are thieves like they just, you know, and I know this even from my own writing where you're just you're constantly just like, oh, I'll take a little bit of that guy and a little bit of that, her over here. And like like, you know, you're you're constantly you know, you're not even conversing with people. You're just like recording. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's, uh, so sometimes you see yourself showing up in scripts in not always the most flattering ways. So. All right. I, I could talk about Stargate forever, but we, you do have a life 
beyond Stargate. Of course, not really. not there, really. there was <laughs> Debug, the movie that you directed yes. with Jason it almost, Momoa. That almost killed me. That, oh, wait. Okay, explain that. Oh, it was miserable. What a miserable experience. I, I, it was one of those things. It, I, I feel like I, I had done Dog's Breakfast, which was a true labor of love. Like I had basically paid for everything myself, and what I didn't pay for myself, people had come in and said, "I want to be a part of this." It was like it was like doing a, a play in the barn. Everyone was just so, you know, damn happy to be there, and we just had such a great time doing it. And it was just such a wonderful experience throughout. You know, then it gets picked up by MGM. Like we made it for like one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, and then MGM picks it up for international distribution. You know, and it's you know it's it's over. It's you know like two million or something they've made right. on this right. film already. So it's, it's so it was just a wonderful experience, and then. We went to make this. I wanted to make a film, and I feel like this is where the end. You got to be so careful with the industry, where you start trying to second guess what people want from you, and you go like, "Well, no, but I'm like, I'm a sci-fi guy who I should do this kind of thing." Mm -hmm. And you start, and I feel like that was a script that I tried to make to make everybody happy. And then when we got into the actual process of making it, which was just ridiculously short. Um, prep time and and you know there was like a full rewrite like the weekend before we started shooting because we we because the 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 lighting had screwed up and it was just it was a it was like anything that could go wrong did go wrong and i sort of assumed that because having done some directing before i knew that was what i was getting into but this was just on another on another level and it just you know um it, it just it was it was a really like it was man those were dark times like it was you know, and it's and at the end of the day, I came out of it and and I, you know, and it's not the film. I set out to make a film about I said to film, I said to make a, a film about, you know, uh, about uh, Hal from 2001. But from his perspective, like I, you're supposed to feel sorry for him. He's supposed to be right, he was right. the good guy. You know, my 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 point was always like if Clint Eastwood was playing Hal, he'd be kicking those dirty humans off his spaceship. You know, like he's like, you know, it would be, you know, he was just protecting his his home turf. And it, and it ended up being, you know, destiny, final destination in space, <laughs> a bunch of like half naked, you know, cliches running around. And I it just I mean, you know, it was it was uh, it was sort of a painful process, but a really a really uh, I think a really important lesson to learn. And I see this happen to people going out of L.A. all the time where they go down and they are themselves and they go down, and they try to they they try to then create something that that they think people want. And and the the true uh, the true power in Hollywood is originality, is right. being right. yourself. And for actors, that's the hardest thing in the world to do. And when you take that and put that into writing and directing, it can be it can be murder. You know, what I mean, like it really just, you know, um, I mean, I learned a ton of stuff. I, you know, there, I made some some friendships for life. I lost some friendships for life, which is really to me, films aren't worth that. Um, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I learned how important it is to be true to what you're, to, to who you are and what you, how you want to be seen. And, uh, I, and I, I think this, unfortunately with film, you know, those things, now that will now be around forever. That will be, you know, every mistake that was in that, in that film hurts me. Whereas in Dog's Breakfast, every mistake in that film, and there are many of them, I laugh at because I go like, yeah, you know what? Those were all my decisions. Those were like, I made the totally stupid decision to do that. Fantastic. Whereas with Debug, you know, it was supposed to be, um, you know, it was all that stuff was supposed to be looked after. It was supposed to be handled. It was a, you know, I kept being told, oh, now you're making a real movie. And I was like, what? Uh, what I liked my real movie, you know. So it was, it was really, it was really interesting. I mean, it's, it's again, I would never want to go through it again, but I thought it was very telling. And weirdly, it it really like jumped forward to to Shape of Water, talking to Guillermo del Toro about making films and how he'd gone through that process with other films where he'd, you know, where he was tearing himself apart because he was making someone else's movie that he thought was his, you know what I mean? Um, and just how he, he realized that you, you don't make a movie, you don't do anything. Like he applies this to movies, but the reality is I now apply this to everything. You don't do anything unless you, you will die if you don't do it you know what i mean yeah. like it's 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 not about needing to or wanting to or what or that's the right idea or the right thing to be doing you gotta like it's gotta be you not just be what you want and and that was so 
eye-opening to me and so inspiring to hear him talk about having similar experiences, you know, uh, on brilliant films, <laughs> you know, admittedly, we weren't debugs, um, you know, uh, but it was that it was, I said, I sort of came out of the tunnel working on, on Guillermo's movie and, and realized sort of what I'd learned, if that makes sense. Well, it's you all know, part of the lessons. Yeah. All the yeah, lessons he, learned. That's it. Well, that's it. And again, and that's the other thing is, you know, you, you live your life and if you can, if you want, you can go down. To, I like, I went to some dark places after debug and the reality was getting out of that was realizing wait, you made a movie. How cool is that? You got somebody gave you money to make a movie, you know, it sucked, but you know, you, you know, that's, you're doing what you So what the people make bad movies, let's, you know, move on. Let's make something else. You know what I mean? So I, I keep thinking of Ed Wood, you know, Oh, you hated my last movie. Well, you're going to love my next one. You know, like <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the, part of the game, but there's a frustration. I think from, for, for a nerd like me, you want to do everything you want it. Like I'm used to yeah. being able, I like playing with circuit boards and building things in it. You are there for the beginning, the middle and the end. And Filmmaking is not like that. Filmmaking isn't like going up to a canvas and making and doing a painting and going, there you go. What do you think? You know, it, it's 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 such there's so much input from so many different people. And what so inspires me about independent film and this like the Red Giant stuff, like going back to Kilogram and things was that we're getting it's reducing technology is allowing us to make these things smaller and smaller, allowing people like me. And more importantly, I think future generations, younger kids, uh, younger kids, uh, or even just young people, um, to create stuff with far more control than we could ever do. Look at, look at YouTube. You know, YouTube's a great example of people doing what they want to do themselves, by themselves. They've created a persona, a brand, a business, um, a passion. You know, it's it's uh, it's so inspiring to me. Like, it's just, it's so, like, that's, that's a future I want to be a part of. Oh, I would love to talk about Hunsucker in the uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. I would love to talk about <laughs> Fleming in The Shape of Water, which, by the way, we're all going to be watching this Sunday to see if um, you know, it's definitely going to come home with some awards. I know which one I wanted to get. Uh, oh, which, yeah. By the way, fantastic job. <laughs> the, uh, Fleming was, was note perfect. Um, <laughs> although everyone That's keeps true. commenting, where's his mustache? <laughs> I know. I, well, I, here's the thing is I'm working on the Einstein hair and I'm subtly trying to grow the beard, the mustache as well. But Jane keeps catching me and making me shave. So, um, um, yeah, uh, sorry. I, and, I, and I'd love to go into those. But there is one thing I think we need to talk about. And that is the fact that you are a geek. You are a huge geek. You are a real geek. In fact, we have people in the chat room saying, you know, he doesn't come across to me as an actor. And that's a good thing. It's Yes, because you are actually a geek. And we can prove that because of upgrade required. This I, I love this. Uh, the mission statement, you said you're on a quest to render disabilities disabilities obsolete through technology. Tell me about <laughs> Upgrade Required. Uh, this is a – well, this is – I met this guy, Q, uh, who's, in the, who's in the suit at the back there um, because I had put out this silly little video that said that I had wanted to be Han Solo but I ended up being C-3PO. It was sort of a science fiction, like, you know, like taking stock of your life and, and all this kind of stuff. And he got back and said, well, you know, I wanted to move. I can't. So I want to be a cyborg. <laughs> okay. And and I was like, what the heck? You know, nerd alert. Don't make eye contact. Avoid this one. But then I, I was sort of drawn in and I checked out some of his stuff. And I was so intrigued by this kid who who, um, you know, was was just, you know, just out there you know, like making a name for himself on YouTube. He was actually, he's actually debunking religious organizations, which, which was, which was interesting at like at 14 or whatever, like like going head to too. head with, yeah, well, with hypocrisy basically of, of these, of these organizations, um, well, some of them. And, um, uh, and he, um, so I just got in touch with him and I, you know, I, I was, I started talking to him and I, my wife jokes that I was kind of jealous because there's this guy who has access to the complete, the, you know, the collective knowledge of the human race. And he's plugged into this thing, thanks to the Internet, most of the day. And all the boring administrative stuff, as I would call it, you know, like living your life is is has to be by nature of his disease. It has to be looked after by uh, other people or technology or whatever. And so as a result, he's. To me, he's almost more human than human. Like he's he's the quintessentially what us humans like to think of themselves as, as these thinking, brilliant, 
machines that can solve any problem, you know, not think of ourselves as machines, but, you know, that we, we like to think of ourselves as these sort of intelligent, intelligent beings, really, you know, um, you know, uh, and, and, and that strangely, that really caught my attention. And we ended up talking a lot. And my wife eventually said, look, you know, you talk to this guy more than you talk to half your friends. Why don't you, why don't you make a film about this? And I thought, oh, fantastic. But weirdly for the wrong reasons. I, I, I didn't wasn't so interested in making the movie as I was interested in making the robotics and stuff that would be required for this. So as the years have gone, I've I've sort of changed my perspective on it. And now I really want I really want a Mythbusters style half hour where the family can sit down. But instead of, you know, and we'll do a lot of blowing up things and burning things and things as well. But but with an eye towards, you know, using some of these technologies that are available to to solve disability related problems and they're so cool because like who doesn't want a robot like who didn't grow up wanting a robot that that's happening now that stuff's available now and i keep meeting my idea behind it was that with upgrade i kept meeting people like q or people who were interested in helping people like you or people with other disability related things or people with other technologies that they wanted to use towards solving problems in the world and i thought what a great sort of you know, I mean, it's it's a film because that's what I do. But it, the reality is I want it to be more than that. And I'm still struggling to figure out what that is. And part of an offshoot of that was trying to bring this sort of my excitement about technology to kids so that when they saw, when they see that they're building things in school, they can be building things that will change the world or change the world for people that they know. You know, we there's a there's a kid in our class who who has a partially formed arm. And apparently she's not doesn't like talking about it and uh, in fact doesn't wear her prosthetic arm. And, you know, we're in we're in doing our tech terrorist thing one day and she says, you know, I've got a robotic arm. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, I didn't even notice. Like, she just wore long sweaters and stuff. And uh, I said, oh, cool. Like, where like would you at home or what's the what's the dish? She goes, no, it's in my locker. I was like, well, go get it. What are you doing? <laughs> so she comes up, clunks this thing down on the on the on the desk and goes like, why can't mine do that? Because we had this little like claw that could work on its own and it could rotate around and stuff. And she's stuck with this like 1970s, you know, prosthetic that doesn't even match her skin tone. You know what I mean? Like it was just it was like it was frustrating to her and to me that that this stuff wasn't available to her. So and, you know, and that got her excited about programming. Like, where's that connection? You know what I mean? Like she started programming this robotic arm to do things. And she went from wanting to be a soccer star to wanting to be a, a programmer and rock, and a soccer star. So, um, you know, it's just that kind of stuff. These things keep coming up. I keep finding people who I go, oh, I, you know, I know somebody who could help with that. And we sort of put it together. And I, I so so that's that's what Upgrade Required is. Upgrade Required is a sort of a series, I think, that will hopefully shine some light on this and get some attention and make people realize how exciting and fun this stuff can be. But that my ulterior motive is to actually be able to 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 do this for real and continue doing it. I, I have to say, you've got me excited. You've got a lot of people in the Twit community excited about that because that's, oh, good. that's exactly well, what I need we want to see. We want to see something like it. I mean, we love builders. We love Mythbusters. If you can combine that, we're in. Well, that's it. And also just to show that everyone can sit down and watch because I think it's important the, you know, that kids see – I, I, I think it's less important to teach kids how things work exactly than it is just to inspire them so that they understand that they can make these things work or that they can do these things. You know, there's such a focus on getting the nuts and bolts of the essential out of the way. But I think at the risk of losing that sort of that childish, the science fiction wonder of creating your own worlds, you know what I mean? And that's where this stuff comes in. This is, this is science fiction, but it's happening, you know? Like, you know, like, EA are building uh, prosthetic arms that are straight out of out of out of their games, you know, straight out of their cyborg games and stuff. Which now I, I can't remember the name of it now. Is it Deus Ex or X Deus? Right, or what, right. I, I never Ex get that Machina. right. Ex Machina, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So you know what I mean? Like that's like this stuff is happening. Iron Man, you know, like like you know, uh, uh, you know, Iron Man shows up and, and delivers a, a, a an Iron Man arm. You know what I mean? Robert Downey Jr. is there giving kids arms. I like wh like wh this is a world. This is a world I want to be a part of. You know. 
And by the way, I've always thought that you should be part of the Marvel Universe, so we need to work on that if you could. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. fine with that. <laughs> I would be happy with that. Yes. <laughs> we have been speaking with David Hewlett. He is, uh, as, as we wrote, by the way, we chose his lower third. He is a maker. He is a movie star. He is a super genius. I can uh, put that on a business card. <laughs> it's, it's yours. It's yours. Uh, now, if, if you could... Please tell the folks where they can find you, where they can find your work. But before you do that, can you confirm that the scarf behind you is supposed to be the fourth doctor's scarf? Absolutely. But here's the problem. I'm allergic to wool. Oh. So trying to find an accurate scarf that isn't made out of wool, that was the best I could do. Twit Army. It was actually a, a fan got me that. Twi Twit Army, uh, you've, you've had the gauntlet thrown down. So there you go. Go. I mean, it's so sad though to be like I, I can't even I can't even wear a proper Doctor Who scarf because it because I get hives. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry, but I know what will make you feel better, and that's by directing our audience to Upgrade Required, uh, uh, directing them to your work. What What do you want them to see? What do you think will make them grow their imaginations? I I think. Well, look, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, what I've been doing a lot of this is on Twitter. So if you want to like get in touch on Twitter, if the stuff that comes up, you know show us a picture, show us a video. Um, I, 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 the, <laughs> what, a, what a flattering shot of myself I put up. Um, you know, that's the, that's sort of my, that's my forum right now, but we also have upgraderequired.org, um, which is right now is very, you know, very early stages, but I'm, I'm thinking what we're going to need to do is create some kind of a, of a, of uh, you know, I'm about to date myself, a bulletin board system, some kind of a chat system where we could start, um, uh, letting people start you know, sort of plotting and conspiring together because uh, I'll tell you some of my email, as you know, we've been we've been chatting about it, but some of my email um, uh, 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 correspondence are getting really long and complicated now. So I think that needs to start being put in a in a in a in a in a, in a forum sort of situation so we can start properly doing this because I keep meeting like this week alone I've had like three conversations with incredibly like one of the guys this fantastic this toy maker from england who has like this completely autonomous robot wandering around his his house which is honestly better than most of the billion dollar toyota type things that i've seen out there um and he's created this um i've been calling it alexander which is basically a barometric way of of communicating with alexa so if oh. you can't if you don't have the actual muscle power to to speak and activate oh, Alexa, okay, yeah. this will use barometric pressure changes. And it means that people behind you talking aren't going to affect your interaction with it. Um, you know, it's just stuff like that. I, I And I just, I welcome anybody. I, this is the funny thing. Everyone I talk to either knows someone who needs help with this stuff or who uh, has has technology they want to get out there to help, to help people. Um, and it's not a benign help thing. It's not like we show up and go like, you know, oh, you poor thing. You know, it's you know, you know, Q is Q is far more involved in the in the in the design and 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 uh, um, you know, and the logistics of this stuff. He does his own cooking show for for God's sake. Um, you know, it, it's it's about empowering people, whether they are you know whether they have disabilities or whether they have you know super abilities you know um and it's about turning those disabilities into super abilities so um you know if anyone's got anything that you think you know is going to is going to sort of resonate with this approach and i'm i'm also looking for help on how to structure this thing because i don't i really don't know you know i make movies i you know i pretend to be smart so now i got to actually start doing some smart stuff oh i think there's plenty of smart in there that you haven't tapped yet <laughs> Hewlett. In the chat room. <laughs> this has been a singular pleasure. I, I haven't spoken to you like this uh, for years, actually, probably close to yeah. three or four years when we did yeah. it for Padres Corner. Um, it's been so much fun. Just to, oh, to speak well. with, with a geek first, who also just happens to be an actor in some of my favorite series. So it's, <laughs> this, is, this has been a wonderful time. Thank you for spending your time with us. Thank you for sacrificing some ski time. To be no, this is good. The, the longer I'm talking to you, the less time I'm falling down a hill. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's entirely it's entirely selfish. <laughs> well, I will bid you farewell so you can get to that. And oh, and don't forget, we're, we are kind of hoping to collaborate on a few things. And we are. you you have an open invitation. Once I move to Rome, you're always welcome. If you want to stay 90 seconds away from St. Peter's, I will have a functioning studio by then, and you could actually make it a work trip. When are you? Uh, when are you getting there? Uh, September. So September of this year is my official move. All right. 
count on count on it. I'm there. I, I like. I'm you kidding? I'm like that's that's now that's that you know that's the kind of. Uh, that's the kind of offer you don't get often. We have video proof. We have video proof. So there you go. <laughs> again, Hewlett. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. A pleasure. Let's do it again soon. Indeed. Indeed. All right. And folks, thanks to you for joining us for this episode of Triangulation. Don't forget that we do the show every Friday at 3 o'clock Pacific time. If you want to watch us live, you can go to live.twit.tv and actually interact with us through our chat room at irc.twit.tv. Uh, if you want to see older episodes of Triangulation, because our back catalog is filled with some wonderful, wonderful people, you can always find that at twit.tv slash triangulation or try. There you'll find the back episodes as well as where to subscribe so you can get Triangulation automatically delivered into your device of choice. You can get an audio version, a video version, or a high definition video version, as well as uh, at twit.tv as wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare, the digital Jesuit, saying see you next time on Triangulation. <laughs>